Well, welcome back. It's Dr. Cameron again from San Diego. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, spend the last hour and a half with uh, so many followers from all over, uh, from Australia to United Kingdom, Germany, uh, Canada, and uh, countless other countries. It's a, it's a pleasure. And this is all about uh, encouraging doctors to join the physician training program, uh, trying to uh, get funds for the physician training program. We're using the power of us uh, to help uh, uh, generate money through the web, through social networks, through Facebook, uh, back to the uh, power of us on ILADS. And, uh, uh, but uh, lastly, it's just important just to share some of the things that are happening at this meeting. And what you've just been seeing is uh, Dr. Jones is so precious. Uh, he's been working with children for so long. He's so good at um, looking beyond the original diagnosis and looking again at what's underneath that, that, that child. So being uh, in practice in Connecticut, uh, he's beloved. He's been a physician trainer for some time, uh, and he's um, taught people who have gone on to teach uh, others. And so it's, a, it's a nice that he could spend a few minutes uh, giving us a video and, uh, and talking to him. I'm here with Dr. Cherry. Now, Chuck, Cherry is a, um, from North Carolina, and uh, she's a PhD. And uh, I was uh, so impressed today when um, she was able to share uh, some original research, both big studies and uh, also able to articulate individual, uh, uh, individual people with Bartonella. So welcome, welcome this evening. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And I, so I, because Bartonella is um, one, of the, um, one of the organisms that you, know, you, you hear that it's in cat scratch fever, but you also hear that it's in a tick. So therefore, it's quite often in my practice that uh, I'm trying to decide who has Bartonella, who has Lyme, who has Babesia, could they have both? Um, even if, if Bartonella is from the cat, it's still important. So why don't you share with me some of the things that you talked about uh, today? Right, so uh, Bartonella, Bartonella hensilae is one of, is the causative agent of cat scratch disease, as, uh, as you mentioned. And so it is transmitted to the cat by the cat flea. And uh, so they're actually, though that is one Bartonella species, there are over 28 species or subspecies which have been identified, um, 17 of which have, uh, are zoonotic. And so it's, um, so you have your vector, which is, uh, you know, really it harbors the bacteria, and then you have animals, which are your hosts. And uh, that's how the cycle goes from vector to reservoir host to human. So when, when someone gets Bartonella, mm -hmm. um, of course, you're never going to know if it's from the cat or, um, or an individual. Um, now, you focus more on that one organism. Right. But did some of them have Lyme disease at the same time? That's true. That's true. And we're seeing, um, there was a, one study that we did by a, a rheumatologist in Maryland. And uh, it was a study of almost 300 patients. And 65% of the Bartonella PCR positive patients were also uh, diagnosed with Lyme or babesiosis. Well, that's uh, in my practice uh, in New York. That's common. I'll, I'll find uh, evidence for more than one infection. Mm -hmm. And of course, the difficulty is knowing which infection is important, uh, or maybe both infections are important. So uh, when you started looking at some individuals who had Bartonella, mm -hmm. you must have been working with a team. Uh, and, and a clinician, you're working with a clinician? Yes, so uh, Dr. Robert Moziani in Maryland, he is a rheumatologist and he is uh, also our chief medical officer at Galaxy Diagnostics and uh, where we uh, do Bartonella testing. And then Dr. Ed Breitschwert at North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine uh, has been working for uh, 30 years in, in vector borne diseases and uh, has really been on the forefront of, of Bartonella research. And then uh, also Dr. Ricardo Maggi at North Carolina State University has really done a lot for bringing forth the technology that we have now to uh, diagnose Bartonella. Well, I noticed that, that having a team like that, uh, the level of uh, research, the level of understanding of, of Bartonella has gone way up. So it sounded like um, um, it affected both uh, a parent and a child uh, were presented, and it was interesting to see um, they each had their own uh, sets of symptoms. Yes. 
So the, the father, the case was a father and his seven-and-a-half-year-old daughter with uh, both had Bartonella species co-infection. The father was a veterinarian uh, who initially presented with arthralgias and fatigue and uh, progressive weight loss, and he was diagnosed with uh, Bartonella vinsonii abercoffii genotype 2 as well as uh, Bartonella hensilae, and then was treated with antibiotics and resolved. And then his seven-and-a-half-year-old daughter, uh, she presented more suddenly with uh, neck pains and uh, headaches, and then uh, so she also had BVB genotype 2 as well as Bartonella hensilae. And uh, she was treated and symptoms resolved. And uh, so it's really just showing once again that it's even co-infections of different species within a genus. So it's much more complicated than we, than we previously have, have thought. I know you also um, reviewed a couple papers where instead of on the individual level, they would take like 150 to 200 people and say, well, what, what are patterns? Mm -hmm. And so it sounded like um, um, the last two or three years, there's been quite a bit of uh, strong uh, peer review literature coming out on Bartonella. Yes, there has been. Um, we did a, a study looking at Bartonella species bacteremia in uh, high risk immunocompetent patients, specifically veterinarians, veterinary assistants, and uh, those who, who work frequently with animals. And we see, uh, you know, a really a really strong correlation between those who. Uh, work in the veterinary field, primarily around dogs and cats, who uh, you know do are affected by Bartonellosis, and so that's uh, certainly at Galaxy Diagnostics. We it's a it's a one health, one health initiative, and uh, so it's bridging the gap between animal and human, and it's not always it's not always one or the other. It's it's uh, it's both. Now, um, have when you look at um, the people who had Bartonella, some of them got better. Yes, some of them did uh, after after treatment. They uh, antibiotics. You know, it's different for every patient, but but yes, uh, in the in a lot of cases, the, the patients do get better with antibiotic treatment. Now you're not the treating because you're a PhD. That's correct. Which is in a, but it's great to have a PhD level to bring the level of um, science up, and so you're able to work with clinicians. So um, right. and um, so that's why I can't always ask you what antibiotic that you would prescribe, but uh, do you know what kind of antibiotics the, the clinicians were using for Bartonella? Typically it is uh, uh, two different types of antibiotics when the, when in treatment of, with Bartonella. Uh, doxycycline, azithromycin, or doxycycline rifampin have been the two that I've commonly seen, seen prescribed to patients with Bartonellosis. And so I got a couple of questions on Bartonella. Um, between the two of us we'll get through these. Okay. Uh, uh, this is from the live stream. Okay. Like, what are the sensitivity for the tests that have been uh, uh, for the types of patients you have? Uh, sure. So, from a diagnostic sensitivity perspective, in our initial test comparing Bartonella EPCR using this BAP-GM culture, which is tailored to the growth of Bartonella, when you compare that to doing conventional PCR molecular testing alone, you get a four-fold increase in diagnostic sensitivity. And how specific are the tests? Because specific means that you got the test, mm -hmm. and can you rely on that test? Sure. A and how, so how specific is it? Right. So uh, for, for our test specifically at Galaxy Diagnostics, we use primers that target the Bartonella genus. So uh, we, we can pick up most of the species of Bartonella. And then once we obtain PCR amplicons, that piece of Bartonella DNA that signifies, OK, we've got a potential infection here. We send that for DNA sequencing to confirm that it is a Bartonella species, and we can identify it down to the strain and or genotype of that species. That's a beautiful, like, to bring the level of science up on Bartonella, because mm -hmm. it kind of floundered for a while, because there was an investigator who said, oh, it's just cat scratch fever. It must be from a cat. But mm -hmm. uh, it's nice to just keep moving on with the science of Bartonella. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you had mentioned that sometimes you have to go off antibiotics for testing. And if you do, how long? That is true. And um, so because of the culture method, when we're actually looking to grow the Bartonella in order to enhance the detection, if you're on antibiotics, it can certainly suppress the growth of the Bartonella. And so we recommend to be off antibiotics for at least two weeks before sending in samples for culture. And um, how do the cultures that you're doing differ from some of the other cultures that have been talked about? Right. 
So, uh, as I mentioned, so the culture we use is BAPGM. It's Bartonella alpha proteobacteria growth medium. So for each, for each bacteria, it has certain growth conditions and certain nutrient needs. And so what we've done as a, a collective group at, with our research team in North Carolina State and then at Galaxy Diagnostics is get down to the biochemical level and, and see exactly what nutrients Bartonella needs and make a specific culture for, for the bacterium. And um, now, even though you're not the prescribing doctor, the team, mm -hmm. was it hard to get rid of Bartonella in some individuals? Yes, for sure. It, it is. It's a persistent stealth pathogen, as, uh, as most of these vector-borne diseases are. They're, they're difficult to get rid of. They reside in tissues, and they, there's a cyclical release of the bacteria into the bloodstream. Uh, and so that does make it, you know, as in the case of Lyme, difficult to treat because when is it in the bloodstream? Where is it within the host? So uh, it's, um, it's definitely difficult, but we, we see that it's all about once you have the diagnosis, and then you can work with your physician to go from there uh, to, to uh, get the best treatment possible. And um, there, someone else from the stream also asked, uh, do people just get better without antibiotics? Right, and so that is certainly possible. If you are um, an immunocompetent individual who uh, is exposed to Bartonella, there's certainly, uh, hopefully you'll be able to rid yourself of that infection as with other bacterial species and, and recover you know, without needing antibiotics. So, so certainly we would, we would hope so. Now, what I find in my own practice mm -hmm. uh, of adolescents and adult, adults is that it is hard to narrow down what infection is the dominant one. Um, so, um, you know, you hear stories of somebody says, this is a Bartonella thing because it's so severe. Mm -hmm. uh, but I find people that sometimes Lyme, Ehrlichia, Babesia, Anaplasmosis is, uh, they can also be severe. So it's a, I find that um, even though you're focused so much on this one, it is hard in practice to know which one to, um, is the dominant one. Uh, so sometimes I have to pick an antibiotic that works for Lyme and Bartonella. Uh, did some of the patients that were treated by your team, mm -hmm. did they end up on more than on antibiotics for like Lyme and Bartonella? Yes, and they. I know that there is some, in my knowledge, there is some overlap as far as what certain uh, physicians prescribe for both. But, uh, but definitely in the ones that were seen that co-infections were identified, there were uh, dual antibiotic treatments. And of course, with each patient, treatment duration varies. Well, I can share what I do. Yes, please. Um, because um, I might use doxycycline mm -hmm. if I think that Bartonella's problem, because it also works for Ehrlichia, Anaplasmosis, and Lyme. Um, if I think... Uh, I need to change, then I might use Zithromax or Vioxin because they work for, um, they seem to work for Bartonella and uh, Lyme. And um, then you had mentioned that some of the, your, some of the team, uh, did you mention Rifampin? Yes. Yeah, so I might use Rifampin, not first or second line, but if someone's still sick um, for Bartonella. Uh, and just when I think that Bartonella might be an issue, sometimes I'm concerned with Babesia. Mm -hmm. So I might have to take a little time and treat for Babesia. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the cephalosporins um, were not, you know, you don't hear that they work as well f based on the cat scratch fever. Um, so I might, but I might still have to use that for Lyme. Now, have you heard much about like amoxicillin or septin for uh, Bartonella? Right, and that's not one that, uh, those are not ones that I currently, um, I hear frequently about, so I'm not as familiar with those. Yeah, so uh, when I look closely at the literature, mm -hmm. there isn't much research to answer that question for me. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't really a fair question, yeah. because <laughs> yeah. I can't find anything I, either. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> sometimes, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think that uh, when you look at uh, Bartonella, mm -hmm. I assume it affects kids. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, have, were there very many uh, people that had Bartonella that didn't have cats? So we do, we do occasionally see that. And uh, for example, in, in one case that I presented today of an 18-year-old an female who uh, had a Bartonella cholerae persistent infection over a period of two years, 
She actually was with uh, Bartonella cholerae, so that's a cat adapted Bartonella species. And she had both cat and uh, a cat and a dog, and um, neither of those were uh, Bartonella bacteremic. So it's uh, you know certainly that even with Bartonella hens layer, the cat adapted ones, we find them in other vectors, and it's, so it's not necessary that uh, that a cat could could be involved. Yeah, I think that. Um this type of um, work, you know, you know, at the PhD level, mm -hmm. where you work with lab people, clinical people in North Carolina, is um, really bringing um, us to a higher level. And uh, when you share this type of information at a professional meeting at ILADS, it um, reminds us all that um, the importance of rigor. Um, young professionals um, all working together to solve these issues. So that's why I was proud of having you at the meeting. Well, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed it and I learned so much uh, here myself. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. That was uh, uh, Dr. Cherry uh, from uh, North Carolina, a PhD uh, and a promising uh, individual. And I just wanted to share some time with you uh, on this live stream.